Hello everybody, welcome to another installment of A Rebel Without Applause. This time, not from the happy confines of my television studio apartment in the wood of the holly, by that I mean Hollywood, but no, someplace way far away on the order of about 1,300 miles from like the that. coastal plain of California. I'm in Belle, say it, tell me, Belle, Belle Fouche. Belle Fouche, South Fouche. Dakota, and I'm in the very comfortable and incredible confines of this little mini micro museum, but it's, it's more than that. It's the home of paleo adventures and the personal incredible accomplishment of my newest best friend on earth, Walter Stein. <laughs> Thank you. And he is a paleontologist who has made an incredible career out of the Cretaceous era outcroppings in the badlands of South Dakota, which is within just, uh, well, we're just surrounded by this stuff. So I want to yeah. thank you first for having me in your, oh, you're this incredible very well, place. Very welcome. Nice to see you. Good, good for you to be here. Appreciate you coming out. Yeah, well, it was. Nice stuff to show you. Good. Well, we're here to do that. Well, we were going to be in the field today. Yeah. But uh, nature has had another opinion, so we decided we'll start here in the museum, which is a. Uh, it's perfect. It's cold and rainy. We're just on the verge of the, the season change as winter grips this place. Tell me, Walter, where I am, and just an overview of what you've created here, because it's incredible. Let's sure. just look around. Well, of course, this is this is Paleo Adventures. Uh, right. We are a fully independent private company that goes out and tries to find dinosaur fossils, uh -huh. dinosaur skeletons. Um, we do a variety of things. One of the main things that we do is tours. So we take uh, take families who are interested in paleontology, uh, usually with one or two young kids. Um, who think they want to become paleontologists, and then we take them out into the field, we train them, we show them the proper techniques for digging up fossils, um, and uh, we put them through the paces. And yeah, it's a, we either make them or break them, as I like to tell the parents. <laughs> so you turn as many off from paleontology they, they, as, you, as you turn on. You probably turn a few off, yeah, when they realize how hard work it is. Yeah, well, you know, what you've yeah. done here is so incredible because th most of the paleontologists that I know or have met most famously Steve Brasotti, have the, you know, the protection of an institution, whether mm -hmm. it's a, it's generally a university or a, a big museum, but you're just here out on your own making this thing work. So to me, that's just incredible. Yeah, most people don't realize that it's perfectly legal, perfect, perfectly ethical to go out and collect fossils. Uh, fossils are all over the place, uh, if you know where to look, including dinosaur fossils. And uh, most people don't realize you can do this on your own. Uh, there are certain things you have to know. There are certain ethics that you have to work by. Right. Um, but it is perfectly legal to go out and collect fossils on private land. You can't do it on public land, but you can do it on private and, land. And you obviously have arrangements with the various ranchers. And, right. And, and they can have a financial interest in what you find as well. You work yeah. out deals. Absolutely. We work uh, with private ranchers under a signed contract. Um, I don't go out on anybody's property unless that contract is signed. Right. It, it has uh, a lot of protections for both the rancher as well as myself. And, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of these ranchers that we work with, they start as, as a business deal and mm -hmm. they wind up like family. Uh, some of the folks we've been on, on their properties for over 15 years and, and they're, they're like our friends and family now. So you're from New Jersey. Yes. So you're not a, a, a Dakotan by, uh, nope. so how, what was that like for you just coming here and trying to yes. feel like, you know, making people trust you, you're, you're yeah. sort of an outsider. I, I'm, I'm guessing it must've been a challenge. Well, it's always a challenge. You know, I, I, like I said, I grew up in Southern New Jersey, a little place called Maple Shade, uh -huh. 25,000 people. And it's not even on a map for most maps. Um, but I grew up about uh, 15 minutes from uh, where the first partial skeleton of a duckbill dinosaur was found back in 1858. It was a hadrosaurus foci. And that was in a marl, or was that what the, was it the word? It was. Yeah, it was a marl. It was. Uh, they were quarrying it, I believe, for road construction material. I think. Um, and bam, there's a there's a duckbill dinosaur sitting there. And, yeah. And so some of those creatures were still there waiting for young Walter to find. They, they were, yes. Uh, at the age of six, I knew I always wanted to become a paleontologist since then. And uh, I've been hunting the great beasts ever since. Um, out east, there's a lot of good fossil hunting locations. But out west is where it's at. 
Yeah, the West is the best, right? Man? Right. Yeah. yeah, and that was, of course, what happened in history when the the yeah. were the centers of science were in New England, uh, in famously in Philadelphia and in uh, Connecticut and New York, mm -hmm. but the the frontier, the the age of discovery, is right where we're sitting. Absolutely. And um, of course, I don't want to give the lecture because you're the one that knows. But it was that there were there was tremendous competition to retrieve the bones that were scattered in the exact vicinity that we're sitting. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as as Americans were heading west, as the pioneers were were advancing westward, um, a lot of times there would be these survey crews that would go out. The U.S. Geological Survey, for example, um, surveys for the road railroads. Right. Um, um, uh, I'm trying to think some of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers right. was another survey, and paleontologists would attach themselves to these surveys and yeah. would kind of ride along with them, using the protection of the army sometimes, uh, and and look for fossils on on that route. Um, so, like, it would be like Powell and Bridger, some yeah. of these early Wheeler, yeah. mm -hmm. explorers, mm -hmm. and there were two famous. Mm -hmm. Cope and, um, and uh, Marsh, Marsh, who became deadly rivals mm -hmm. in the pursuit of uh, this new truth. One of the things that blows my mind as I read about this is how Darwin's book, or Origin of the Species, arrives pr almost within a decade or so before these Western discoveries and yeah. how that must have just throttled people's perceptions of of the world at that time. A lot of stuff was going on that mid to late 1800s, you know, and, and, and one of the biggest, of course, would, would have been the, the, the origin of the species and, and how people related to that. Uh, you know, of course, it was mostly a Christian. Right. <laughs> still is. There, and still is in, yeah. many, in many ways, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. No, absolutely but. not. <laughs> I have some jokes there, about that, but yeah, I yeah. won't. Well, <laughs> The only problem with Christianity is nobody's tried it. That's the only. Uh, <laughs> that's the only issue I have. I, I actually. I know a few. I'm deeply connected to Jesus because we're both yeah. nice Jewish boys. He was a prophet. I'm a comedian. He walked on water. I surf, and both of our mothers thought yeah. we were the son of God. So we have a lot in common. That's good. That's good. That's yeah. good. Okay. Yes, but it is very big conflict sometimes, right. especially in that mid to late 1800s. We had. The, Science was really starting to get going, especially paleontology really began mm -hmm. in the middle of the 1800s. Um, dinosaurs weren't named until 1852, I believe it was. Um, Out of a, a guy in England, Sir right? Richard Owen, yep. Yeah. Yep. Kind of cranky looking English gentleman. Right. Right. Um, so you, you throw all these academics who have various backgrounds, many of them religious backgrounds, and, right. and you have this, this conflict. You have the conflict of the, the settlers moving west with the Native American tribes. Right. You have conflicts over industry versus uh, just the whole 1800s is a fascinating time. Right. And of course, we're right in the shadow of the Civil War. Exactly. A huge conflagration has just overwhelmed America. Mm -hmm. um, they've seen violence on a scale that nobody had ever really experienced. Just right. in the decade that it preceded, there's a revolution and you know, and civil liberties and mm. in our constitution and the railroads plowing its way out. One of the things that strikes me about that moment in history in this place is the le all this these levels of extinction. Mm. So we have the extinction of the buffalo, yes, which fortunately there's they've survived. These are the big megafauna mammals, uh, you know. And we have essentially an extinction of a way of life, hunting, gathering, Native people, of course, yeah, and then they're digging up a level of extinction that was almost unimaginable. Mm -hmm. You know, I can only imagine. My my thought is, so these guys are digging up these bones, maybe in the shadow of the railway, and they go, "Well, how come this? You know, like this guy over here." My, just, my own thought would be like, "Well, what happened? Why is this guy gone?" He goes, "Well, he couldn't get on the ark." Yeah. The Noah's Ark was all filled <laughs> up. You couldn't have a reservation. It's very important. All right, so what we're looking at right now is a short-necked plesiosaur. It's okay. called a polycotylid. Uh, plesiosaurs, when you typically think of a plesiosaur, you're thinking of like a Loch Ness monster type thing. Right. Really long necks, little heads, lots of sharp needle-like teeth for catching fish, or conical teeth for catching fish. Um, this is a specimen that we recovered just north of town back in 2007. Wow. We call this one Doc. 
Um, it's named after the local veterinarian uh, for uh -huh. many, many years. Um, Doc is only about 40% complete. And you can see it's not quite a finished mount. Um, but this, this plesiosaur is a, a rare one called a polycotylid with a bigger head, a shorter neck, uh, and you'll notice that the hands and feet are modified into paddles or flippers. Right, you can see that. Look yeah. at all the articulated small bones that you guys found. Oh, yes, yes, yes. This one right here it's had already breached the skeleton. Uh -huh. The skull had broken up and tumbled down the hill. The neck vertebrae had tumbled down the hill. A lot of the flippers from the front and the chest had already weathered away. Right. Um, the weather, you know, weathering and erosion is both a, a double-edged sword. You know, we. Uh, we have to have weathering and erosion to find them, right. but we want to find them quick because the weathering will destroy them and damage them. So in this particular case, it was weathering for so many years, the skull was gone, the front chest was gone, and, uh, and one of the flippers was essentially gone. Now, just it's plainly obvious as you looked at it, this was a creature that was not walking on land, but swimming in an inland yes. sea that dominated this area. Is that right? Yes. Picture a penguin crossed with a crocodile crossed with a fish, <laughs> or uh, a sea lion, how about that? A sea, sea lion right. swimming in the shallows about 90 million years ago, right. um, chasing after fish. Now this creature went extinct, right? Yes. So, what's, but what makes me think is like there's certain creatures, I mean certain uh, qualities in the creature, certain attributes that we still see today like in the fins of a seal, the, 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 the teeth of a crocodile. Sure. So do you think this creature's DNA hit a dead end or it managed to cross the divide of extinction? Uh, this the dinosaur's DNA is mostly gone. This particular line of animals have all gone right. extinct. They went extinct at the same time as the dinosaurs. Uh, you know, there might be some earlier snippets from ancestors that uh -huh. continue on. Um, but when you look at, the, say, a whale compared to this, or, or, or a pinhead or a seal. Sure, the, mod the modifications to the, f the hands, the forearms, into flippers, that's an example of what we say convergent evolution. Right. Uh, so two different species completely different. are evolving with similar mm -hmm. tools or faculties. Evolving in a similar situation, a similar environment, doing similar things over multiple generations, thousands and thousands of generations of successful adaptations, right. eventually leads to a similar structure. So form follows function. Form follows function, basically. So this is a creature that lived in what we would call the Cretaceous era, yes. right? Yes. And pretty much everything within a few hundred miles of where we are, I'm getting the feeling is Cretaceous. Yes, absolutely. Um, but there is, you know, Black Hills. We're on the edge of the northern Black Hills. Right. Right. And Black Hills are basically an igneous uplift. It's a big bubble of hot molten rock that pushed its way up and mm -hmm. bent and folded everything upwards. So right here in Belfouche, we're on one of those outer rings of rock uh, that is part of the seaway. It used to be lying flat and then it was bent upwards. And then erosion then carved it down. So we're starting to see stuff that was way deep that's been pushed up and bent. Uh, if we were on this spot about 90 million years ago, right. this is what it would have looked like. Uh, this is what we call the Western Interior Seaway. This was a seaway that split North America in half. It was bound on the east by the Appalachian Mountain Range and the Ozarks, which are kind of old mountain ranges. Right. So this is before uh -huh. country music and all. <laughs> yes. This exactly. is before Loretta Lynn was born. A little bit. Okay. Because she just passed. So I just. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, definitely long before that. Uh -huh. um, and uh, over on the west is bound by the early Rocky Mountains, which were just kind of foothills and right. volcanic chains. And, and California is yet to be. California is not even there yet. So California. the best surf spots at that time would be up in here. I'm looking at the points, you know. Yes, uh, yeah. So shortly, shortly after this, you get this little embayment right in through here called the Mississippi Embayment, uh -huh. where you get lots and lots of fossil vertebrates down there, a lot of mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and sea turtles and whatnot. And this is and this would be Cretaceous here? That would be Cretaceous. So one of the best places to find those types of animals would have been actually central Alabama, south of Montgomery. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So along the coast, of course, this is completely inundated at that time. Um, right. So, so there's no Carolinas, there's no California. No, not much of them anyway. Yeah. Wow. So the Dodgers, they didn't have a stadium then. They had to 
find mm -hmm. elsewhere. Yeah, and wow. you had two different sets of, of, of animals basically evolving in different directions because they're, cr they're cut off by that seaway. So we see differences between creatures that are found exactly. here than what would be found in, they were on different yes. evolutionary tracks, but during Pangaea time, this was connected so they might've had common ancestors. Exactly. At, at this time though, in the Cretaceous, the sea levels were much, much higher. The continent was much lower. Um, the, the global temperatures were significantly warmer than they are today. Right. So sea levels were much higher. Uh, you didn't have any ice caps, or at least geologists don't believe there were any ice caps. Right. There's no evidence of that. Way higher oceans. Right, right. So that's why you have the entire inner portion of the North American plate completely inundated with seawater. Wow. Th this whole area is a Cretaceous era yes. experience, which just so it's sort of the last generation of dinosaurs preceded by the Jurassic and the Triassic before that. Yep. The boundaries between each era were had big extinction events mm -hmm. generally through volcanism or in the case of cretaceous a big asteroid and maybe a little frosting of volcanism i guess in india <laughs> potentially yes yeah there's some debate about that right right, right. yeah um, but that's one of the biggest discoveries really in the last 50 years is the i guess the understanding of the, of the asteroid event Right. That whole Cretaceous uh, Paleogene boundary has always been a, a, a mystery. Where were all these animals? We're finding all these monstrous beasts in the 1800s and early 1900s. And, right. But they're gone. They disappeared. Why? Right. Why did they go extinct? It's been a question on the minds of scientists for 100, over 100 years. Um, and there's been dozens and dozens of theories as to why they went extinct. Um, everything from alien ray guns destroying them to mammals out competing them. Uh, mammals eating their eggs, for right. example. It's a very mammal-centric viewpoint. Right. Um, but the leading evidence that we're seeing right now, for I think most scientists at least, um, we're seeing a ton of evidence to suggest an asteroid hit the planet roughly about 66.1, same time the dinosaurs disappear. Um, and imagine just a, a six mile wide chunk of space rock coming in at hundreds of miles per hour. Thousands. Um, thousands of miles per hour, basically yeah. slamming into the planet and creating all kinds of environmental chaos. Right. Uh, so, And you could see that boundary in the rocks here, right? Yes. At various places. Yep, at various places. Um, you know, sometimes it's a little difficult to see it, sometimes it's obscured. Uh -huh. But if you know what you're looking for, that little section where you, you start to see a little Z, the Z coal, right. uh, the coal section, and then some claystone, mudstone, and then bam, there's this, there's this clay, this little white line. And that white line is pretty much the, the area where you're going to get your iridium spike, you get your firm spike shortly after that. Right. The most fascinating thing about dinosaurs is they're with us every day to this day. Because after all, mm -hmm. birds. It, true. Are true. dinosaurs. Birds are little baby dinosaurs, that's right. Some paleontologists will tell you that dinosaurs did not go fully extinct, that some of them still live on as birds. I would agree with that. Yeah. You can tell your grandmother that when you're eating your Thanksgiving Day turkey dinner. Yes, we're eating, eating a raptor of some sort. Eating a dinosaur, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but T-Rex, you know, the big dinosaurs, they were certainly, they could not survive that kind of cat cat uh, catastrophe. <laughs> right. Cat what am I saying? Catastrophe. catastrophe. Thank so, you. So, you know, the movie Jurassic Park isn't really, it, it seems like the, well, no, they're Jurassic era sauropods in Jurassic Park. But you get the feeling you're looking at T-Rexes, they weren't really around in the Jurassic era. They're more of a Cretaceous. They're more of a Cretaceous, yeah. They're kind of the end result of probably about 90 million years of, of evolution. Right. And Let's take a walk sure. around Let's and look around. at some of these uh, findings. This is now just, you found this stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, T-Rex is one of the most incredible animals to ever walk the planet. Right. You're looking at an animal 45 feet long. Wow. With a six foot skull full of 50 or so of these big banana shaped daggers. Talk about that piece of jaw bone. Oh, absolutely. This, uh, this jaw was found in one of our quarries uh, up in uh, Butte County, South Dakota. We call it the Tooth Draw Quarry. Wow. Um, the this is a cast now. The original, we actually got into the home of the Fukui Dinosaur Museum. It's oh, one of the cool. biggest dinosaur museums in the world. Um, but the neat thing about this jaw is it has a pathological injury right here. Uh, two large uh, 
injuries, lots of scar tissue around that. Maybe an infection. It's a potentially either a tooth infection or uh -huh. it's possibly a bite mark. These tyrannosaurs were likely territorial, right. um, hunting up and down these river systems looking uh -huh. for prey. And every once in a while, they would encounter another T-Rex they didn't like. And there's uh, a, exactly, a rendering. Exactly. Perfect example of that. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I can see that, but yeah. Yep. One of them clipped the front of the... And, and this may or may not be the same creature, but these are, like, there's a femur here and... Yeah, what we're looking at right here, this is a tibia. This a is, tibia. I, yep, I found this back in 2009. This goes to a partial skeleton we call Leonard. Um, Leonard, so far, we only have probably less than a, two dozen bones of it. Uh -huh. um, we don't have a whole lot of it, but um, we're hoping that eventually we'll be able to start piecing some of these back together and, and show that they're all from the same animal. What's it like when you're just scuffling around in the dirt and it's 90 degrees or 100? Mm-hmm. And you know you're just doing a little walk about, and you see, and then what's that emotional experience like? Well, you're talking about the sense of discovery. That's, yeah, that's that's one of the most incredible feelings that you could possibly have when you're when you're in there walking around, and you just you just see some bones sticking out of the wall, and you realize in about five seconds that that bone is something significant. It's going to a skeleton. It's something maybe it hasn't seen light of day in 66 million years. Maybe right. you're the first person to ever lay eyes on it, uh, and that's just an amazing, incredible experience. It must be like just amazing. Yeah. You go, I, I could die tomorrow. I made my mark. I'm happy. And it, clearly, from just this small display and then the, the, your lab back there, you've had a lot of those moments. We have lots of moments, yeah. We generally get uh, one skeleton a year and possibly uh, over 350 bones from the main quarry, another 250 from an isolated quarry that's attached to it, same, uh -huh. same, same river channel, basically. Um, and usually find lots of other dozens and dozens of other stuff from other ranches and whatnot. And that was where we were going to go today, right? Yeah. Tomorrow, tomorrow, we'll still get you out there. Yeah. It's a little cold and rainy today. I'm good. Uh, but tomorrow, we're going to get you out to that tooth draw quarry where, again, this is an ancient river channel. Okay. Um, it was part of a vast floodplain. Would have looked like northern Florida or coastal Carolinas millions mm -hmm. of years ago, 67 to 66 million years ago. And uh, we're getting remains of uh, multiple di different types of dinosaurs. We have about 25 different types of dinosaurs and probably over 40, 50 different types of other vertebrates. Right. Uh, Any mammals in this same? We do. We do. We get some interesting mammals. These were little tiny things scurrying about at the feet of the dinosaurs. Right. Uh, um, you know, dinosaurs and mammals basically co-evolved. And for over 160 million years, dinosaurs kept their evolution in check for all that time. Right. Uh, mammals didn't get much bigger than the size of a small dog. Um, but our sites are important because we're not just looking at the dinosaurs themselves. We're looking at the entire ecosystem and uh -huh. the whole diversity of what it was like. Right. We're trying to figure out, were these animals thriving? Were they doing really well in this environment? Mm -hmm. Or were they slowly deteriorating and going extinct slowly? Because there's still some paleontologists out there who think that these dinosaurs went extinct slowly. Uh, this one here is a mammal. So it's all part of that ecosystem. And how do we know it's a mammal? Because of the dentition? Because of the dentition, the types of teeth. Uh, those uh -huh. are types of teeth that the mammals or dinosaurs didn't right. necessarily have. Um, I, when I find something, if I don't know what it is immediately, you know, yeah. I've been doing this a while, so I can yeah. usually recognize most things. Uh -huh. But if I see something I can't readily identify, we'll do a little bit of research. Mm -hmm. We'll compare it to other known specimens that have been collected. And if I still can't figure it out, I'll call up some of my academic friends and say, hey, I got this weird thing. What do you think this is? Right. Uh -huh. So, you know, when we're going back to the period of Cope and Marsh and, you know, right. I think the big rush was to identify new creatures yes. right. and get your name on it or name it. And, but is that still the main thing or is it the idea to get a bigger overview of what's really going on in the ecosystem. Well, it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> for, you? For, you? for me, it's I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Uh -huh. uh, you know, there, there is this, this concept that these dinosaurs weren't very diverse, that they were going extinct gradually, and I totally disagree with that. We're seeing data from our sites that suggest it was very, very diverse. We had not just uh, the big three, the Triceratops, T. rexes, and Edmontosaurus, but we're also finding little tiny things like little raptors, mm -hmm. little troodontids, little oviraptorids, 
um, you know. Look at these teeth. You know, so I, I like collecting the small stuff. The small stuff is way easier to curate, way faster to prep, yep. and actually far more significant than some of the bigger ones. Interesting. So here's a here's some examples. These are these are raptor dromaeosaurid claws. Mm -hmm. uh, museums have very few of these on hand, and we tend to find quite a few bits and pieces like this. Yeah. Now something like this will only go to a museum. I don't sell these to on eBay or anything like that. Right. Um, it's like that movie where Indiana Jones says that one belongs in a museum. Uh -huh. Some things do. Some, Some things, things are do. far more important in a museum setting, so you can study them. Uh, this one is one of my favorites. Wow, it's beautiful. Uh, this was a killing claw from a raptor. Uh -huh. You've seen Jurassic Park? Right now, the right. killing claw would be at the extension of their feet. It would be this one right here. That's the one they raised right. up. Uh, I doubt they walked around tapping the ground with them, but mm -hmm. they certainly used it, uh, raised it up. Could use it to help bring down prey. Could use it to climb up things. Um, so if you were in a forest, back in the Cretaceous period. Right. This would be a dangerous place for you to be walking because these, these dinosaurs were likely ambush predators. They could probably use that claw to kind of climb up logs and uh, right. hang on some high ground. Uh -huh. And then when you came walking by, they would leap up into the air and use that sickle-like claw to hook into your side, go for the neck. Scary animals, but beautiful. And we, very bird-like. Very, very bird-like. Very bird-like. Bird and their bones were hollow. Yes, they had hollow bones. And you showed me something here, too, with this, even with the big monster, the T-Rex. Yeah. I don't know if, I can, if that's clear in the video, but you can see that the bone is indeed hollow, which yeah. means they didn't have to carry as much weight. Yeah, absolutely. That one we found weathering out of the wall. It was mostly broken up and little tiny pieces down the... You know, if we don't find them, they fall apart pretty quick. Wow. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's completely hollow. And this, this is, is another a... one that's hollow. This is from a small raptor. Yeah. You got it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A small raptor. We always think of birds as raptors, but mm -hmm. this would be somebody that did not necessarily enjoy flight. Well, its ancestors likely did, or its its cousins certainly close did. Close cousins. Its cousins certainly did. And those did. airline tickets. Yeah. Yes, its close cousins certainly did. This um this little humerus, this is a humerus bone. Oh, okay. So got the, the funniest bone in the body. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have one. No, as a comedian, <laughs> yeah, that's just I, not I, you I got it taken out. Yeah. Remind me to tell you my Putin joke later. Okay. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> Yeah, so this but, is humorous. Yeah, so, so this is a smaller guy than this. Much smaller, much smaller. And, you know, a lot of people are under this impression that um, there just weren't any small raptors around. There weren't small ornithischians. There weren't... But really, the problem is in the preservation. Because this whole Hell Creek environment was a very tumultuous environment. Lots of river systems cross-cutting it. You get volcanic eruptions, dumping a bunch of ash, and then the rivers change course. Um, it's not like a lake deposit. Right. So, for example, and we're kind of all over the top yeah, of the map. Yeah, this is great. But let's, here's a, here's a fossil fish from Wyoming. Right, there's a fossil fish from Wyoming. Beautifully preserved. The whole animal is there. You can see the fine details right. of the ribs and the skull and it, even the teeth and so on and so forth. Right, so that's a lake deposit. Things that wash into lakes tend to sink down and they get fully preserved. Got it. Okay. If it happens in a lake, it stays. Whatever happens in a lake, stays. If it happens in a, in a river, it gets tumbled. If it happens in a river, it's different. It gets mm. tumbled. It gets broken up. Not articulated necessarily. Exactly, that's the word. Right. Not articulated. Right. So a skeleton could first be lying out in that floodplain, get chewed on by T. Rex, just completely decimated by other predators and scavengers and whatnot. Then your little raptors come in for their little meal. Right. And then the next season, after maybe sitting out for several seasons. A flood event comes, it picks up all those little bits and pieces. The lighter stuff goes way downstream, the heavier stuff tends to want to get stuck. And so it becomes completely disarticulated. So what are the chances of little tiny dinosaurs, little birds, surviving? Those, those bones are going to get completely broken up. Surviving meaning to become fossils. To become fossils and then we right. That's a tough, tough, yeah. tough thing to become a fossil. I mean, 
what, just based on what we're finding in fossils, mm -hmm. to me it seems like this place must have been wild, just jam-packed with creatures at yes. every little level of the food chain. Yes. Uh, I mean, clearly the biggest creatures have the best chance to be fossilized, but this... And not only fossilized, but they also have the greatest chance of being found. So back in, we'll jump back to the 1800s, okay? If, right. you're, if you're a cope, a marsh, or a hatcher, or any of those other guys- Or just the, anybody. Running around out there looking for fossils, and you see a big pile of bones, you're gonna see that first, you're gonna work on that first, and everybody back at the museum's gonna be very happy and excited, right? You may completely step over what was the tiny little eggshell bone of a bird and not even see it. Right. Right? So, not only did they have trouble being preserved in the past, but these little dinosaurs, these little birds, little pterosaurs like that, uh -huh. they had they have a greater chance of weathering out in the modern times to make well. it here. So what yeah. we're seeing is just they were peeling an onion, right? With uh, you know, as as uh, erosion, right? And we're just every season you could see new stuff. Exactly, new stuff. And so a lot of a lot of folks, a lot of academics and commercial go, guys will go after the skeletons. Uh, and that's great. It's, it's all very important to recover skeletons, articulated skeletons are beautiful. But I like going after these bone beds because these multi-taxic bone beds, the ones where you're getting a whole diverse array of species washed in, they're right. really teaching us how healthy that ecosystem was. It was pretty healthy, I think. I think it was very healthy. I think they were, they were doing just fine up until they looked up and saw that monster asteroid coming down. Right, and that was a great discovery or, by the, the geologist Alvarez, right? Walter yeah. Alvarez, who wrote, yeah. who's writing about this. Now that feels like established fact, you know, in terms of it's, it's sort of reached the public's mind. Yeah, absolutely. And people absolutely. aren't really, maybe, I don't know if they're debating that to the extent that they used to. Mm. Well, the whole concept of that, ex whether extinction happens is, you know, still debated in some circles, but it, it's mostly accepted. Right. Uh, and as far as the asteroid is concerned, it, there's clear evidence that an asteroid hit. Um, there's also clear evidence of uh, volcanism, extreme volcanism in India. Right. The Deca... Deccan Traps. The Deccan Traps. So, right. India, who is not unlike Australia, was out there, its own continent floating... Yep. This was before they named it the Indian Ocean. This is before yoga, Gandhi. This is <laughs> way back, okay? Way back. Before the sutras and yeah. Buddha. This continent yeah. floats up into the belly of South Asia and creates the Himalayas, but apparently for just a huge amount of time, a massive period of volcanism. Oh yeah, you have over one mile thick of basalt, flow basalts being laid down in sheets. So this is this is pumping out a lot of um, CO2. It's pumping out water vapor. It's pumping out all those greenhouse gases. Um, it's putting smoke into the atmosphere. So right. climates are kind of slow. Or they're they're changing certainly towards the end. And this volcanism was clearly going on for a while. Now the timing of that is a matter of debate. With the asteroid. Yeah. Did the asteroid hit first and then trigger the volcan volcanism? Was the volcanism going on? beforehand and then the asteroid helped make it worse. Um, what I find interesting is that whenever you see one of these big extinction events, uh, such as the Permian Triassic, one of the biggest of all, mm -hmm. what do you see next to it? Well, you see the Siberian traps. So you've, you've got more volcanism, extended volcanism going on, right. but you also might have an impactor there. There's some questions. So about. there's some, real, and these are over such huge, unimaginable spaces of time. Yeah. But you know, when you like imagine an accident, for example, or a plane crash, mm -hmm. generally it's a combination of a few things. So like they didn't have the this, and the thin guy didn't put in the screw right. Mm -hmm. So like, it's not inconceivable to me that you have some things coming together at the same time right. to create, you know, one. Volcanism and an asteroid, they aren't mutually exclusive. And the, the, the power of that impact seems to me that it could very well have, it could have been, there was volcanism going on all the time. Mm -hmm. Just the impact of that could have triggered more, right? It could have, yeah. Right. And what you find is, it's, what's interesting about that mm -hmm. is that if, if uh, the asteroid hit in the, the Yucatan Peninsula, right. right, that would have been on the exact opposite side of the planet 
as where India was. Correct. So it's called the antipode. So those shock waves, they travel all the way around the globe and through the crust and eventually hit a point on the very exact uh, opposite side and helps acerbate or make the, the volcanism even worse. So those, that was a really tough period of time. We're talking about, yeah. I don't know, by an order of thousands of years where it was not a good time to be around. It was a bad weekend in geology. A bad weekend in <laughs> geology. But then it Rock makes plant, you like, yes. doesn't it make you like go, well, wait, there were mammals then and like, right. You know, we celebrate Columbus Day, and you know, we got Christmas for Jesus, and we need a holiday <laughs> for the mammals that, Day. that made it through. Yeah, yeah. Because they carry, we're carrying their DNA at this moment. Mm -hmm. am, am I just blind to that? No, that's absolutely true. Yeah, so, if, if it wasn't for that asteroid, mammals may still have been kind of held into the shadows. And some survived. Right. A handful right. of species, and we're there. We're carrying. We're living in their. Their DNA is in us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we got to rename like Columbus Circle. I think Columbus has gotten too much. <laughs> you know, we're talking about the Indians, and they. You know, he was was a, talking about an extinction event. It was Columbus. Sure. We need some like we're gonna need to identify a mammal, some early early primate that go. made it across. The CT divide, we'll do. or the KT divide, yeah. Cretaceous, Tertiary, yeah. that's the extinction event. I'm using a technical name Cretaceous here. Paleogene. It's supposed to be Paleogene. Okay. KPG now. Oh, oh they've changed it? Yes, they've updated it. I, I accidentally say it myself. Okay, all right. Well, I'm, I'm still, I've always been behind the times. Okay. But they deserve a holiday, and they deserve some monuments. Like, we could there take down some of those Confederate monuments and put in like a, a mammal monument for some, like, <laughs> what was the mammal, like the primate that maybe, a little rodent-sized guy that were? That's a good question. I, I try to stay away from the mammals as much as possible. Right. Yeah, so. Because it gets. Mammals are scary. It gets scary, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm scary, I scare myself in the mirror. Yes, unless I have a beard in my hand, I try not to talk politics, religion, or anything else. Okay, well, you know, About th mammals. this history though, you know, it, it affirms Darwin. Mm -hmm. It challenges a very static vision of Earth True. and of our origins. True. You know, it it it's it it's it's fantastic. Let's look at the. Sure. Take a look over into the your little lab. Okay. Now the plaster jacket is what we use to protect them in the field. It's it's wrapped over the top of the bones. Uh huh. Um, to give you some ideas. So this. So, you, so when this thing was exposed, yeah. this was to the sky, and then you dig out. Nope. No. This was the bottom. This was the bottom. Yeah, this is what. This is the side we could not see in the field. Got it. Uh, the, take a take a dinosaur bone like this. This is a this is a vertebrae from an Edmontosaurus. Wow. And what we do is we dig all the rock off the top of it, mm -hmm. and a little bit off the sides, but not too much. We want a lot of rocks trapped to hold it side. together. Hold it together. And then you dig all the way. We dig under it, and we leave it sitting on a pedestal of rock. Then we take strips of burlap, we go over the top of that. Right. When it hardens, we chisel out underneath and roll the whole thing. We flip the whole thing. And so you're looking at the bottom of what I found. Got it. Got it. So uh, this one is from a dinosaur we call Behemoth. Uh -huh. uh, Behemoth is a ceratopsian. We, we're probably going to be a triceratops, mm -hmm. but it could be a torosaurus. We're not sure yet. Do we know what we're looking at in terms of where on the yeah, skeleton? Yeah, on the skeleton. This is, this is an ilium bone. This is one of the hip bones. Hip, okay. This is a hip bone. It's missing portions of that end and a little portion of that end. We call predepositional break. So it shows us that something happened to the ends of this. Either it broke um, uh, due to predation, mm -hmm. uh, some feeding activity, T. Rex was munching on it, right? Um, or possibly just in the process of weathering and tumbling down, it weathered away. Interesting. Um, we do see some insect borings on here mm -hmm. um, in spots, at least on the other side. We don't we see, some. see many insect fossils, do we? Is no, this soft? Too soft. Too soft. Didn't make the cut. Yeah. Okay. So these are these are kind of like surfboards. You're a surfboarder, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is almost surfboard size. Yeah. And uh, so Behemoth would have been a very, very large Ceratopsian. Um, over here, we and found... And the Ceratopsian is a, it's a plant-eating mm -hmm. guy that was a big 
Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaurus bait. <laughs> yeah, kind of Tyrannosaurus bait. Of course, if I was a T-Rex, I wouldn't go after these guys. These were pretty tough critters. Too much, yeah. The, these were more the buffalo, the bison on the plains. Right, plentiful. Plentiful, traveling large herds. They were quadrupeds, so they were walking on four legs. Uh, and the, the neat thing about these is they have really, really big brow horns. We'll show you one of those later. Right. Maybe and a large frill of bone that protected the back of its neck. Right, so you're gonna get your ass kicked if you mess with oh, these. Yeah. yeah, they're so, often depicted as these docile little, you know, right. things, but they It's weren't. such an arms race, you know, we see it, it's like they're competing for size and mm -hmm. armor. And yes. it, it's just like an arms race. It is. And at some point it feels like size is an advantage until it isn't. Until it isn't. And then it's a big liability. Yep, it's, uh, it's the, the, specialization of an animal it's it's great you can be a specialist you can have a special diet a special environment a special climate and all that good adaptations that make you super special and awesome size being one of those until something happens until the environment changes until a, a new predator is introduced right you know it's great if you're if you're a small little raptor and you're awful showy and you got these beautiful feathers and you can it helps you to mate and produce other offspring right but you're showy right so if a new predator is introduced you're a target all of a sudden right so things change or if an asteroid hits and you're a t-rex you don't have a place to hide you don't have a place to hide and all your dinners are gone you're eating 400 pounds of of food per day you need to keep that engine going that, that right and maybe one engine. of the reasons some of those mammals survived is that they were um mm -hmm. scavengers mm -hmm. so and maybe they could have lived on the insectivores yeah that's one another one of the reasons but all these dead creatures were all over the place so go get, get a meal go back in the cave yep get, grab some you know maybe that was maybe they could hoard maybe they could exactly. store i mean who knows and they had fur which helped keep them warm at night and in because after an asteroid impact, it's going to get cold and dark very, very quickly. Yes. Right? And then you have this warm spike at the end. of At the end, millions of years later, you have this big warm spike because all that CO2 and dust floating around the atmosphere, the volcanic eruptions with the greenhouse gases. Yeah. Comes down. Yeah. Well, they had feathers, right? Uh, they had feathers, but they couldn't. They didn't. Birds could migrate a little faster. Right. They, but maybe the feathers had some value before flight oh absolutely yeah i'm not sure what that was Maybe yeah we're jumping long. all topics all over yeah but it's here. it's part of it so but, let's yeah. move on so this looks like what well, i gotta finish that question i'll finish it you ask a question i gotta finish what it. did i ask you asked well they had feathers right they and did. the feather had to come first right feathers preceded flight they have to because right. you can't fly until you have feathers therefore the feather has a previous use and one of those uses would have been this the sexual selective one where oh, you display display peacocks yes exactly the show where you are the greater chance you're going to be attract mates that's my problem i don't have feathers <laughs> that's why i didn't know. what's my problem i can never meet the right girl now i know i don't have feathers no, he's well got, i have one he's got a feather on the top of his head yeah but it's not helping anyway yeah. go ahead yeah. <laughs> i don't i don't got anything I stumbled and, into a joke i can't help it yeah. <laughs> but uh those feathers also uh, they could have been used for mantling prey to uh, as, as you oh. remember I said raptors were probably uh, Ambush predators could right. climb trees could jump on the backs of things and so on and so forth when when those Raptors whether they're running from the ground or f jumping down from a tree, right? You'll see evolution wise the raptors and the tyrannosaurs start at the same time Tyrannosaurs get bigger bigger heads smaller smaller arms Raptors however get smaller smaller heads bigger bigger arms so what are they doing differently they're feeding differently they're surviving differently imagine that raptor up on the tree jumps off raises its hands arms comes down pounces using those feathers to help mantle that prey. oriented it yeah wow. yeah but what's going on what is that that's a movement of flight that is the evolution of the flight stroke right yes. building of those muscles exactly exactly so a small not not the dromaeosaurus we talked about, because that's way past the evolution of birds. Birds start to show up in the Jurassic period. Right. But birds something with flight. similar to that did that sort of thing. Birds with flight are showing up in the Jurassic. Yes. With feathers. Because we had like the pterodactyls and those aren't... Those aren't birds. Those are pterosaurs. They're pterosaurs. Yep. Mm -hmm. So... Another bit of that kind of 
sort of kind of convergent evolution. They're, they're taking advantage of open niche space in the air. So let's look at some of this stuff here. This is a left jaw, left dentary, right. from what is probably the behemoth specimen. Okay. Triceratops, it's definitely a triceratops. And we'll use a variety of different tools. A lot of them are the same tools that we'll use uh, in the field. Right. Um, brushes, dental picks, exacto blades. And we'll just slowly chip away at the rock and the sand that's, uh, that's on the surface to expose right. the bone. Um, we'll glue spots that are fairly close, hold that together. But in a crack like this, this complex break, what I may have to do is dissolve that glue, uh -huh. take it completely apart, clean out the break and then reattach it and re... re uh, it's a little bit of dentistry, like you've got to maybe create some space, fill spaces and stuff like that. It is, it is, it is. And then with, um, with when there is a gap like this, a mm -hmm. lot of times we will use res restorative material. We'll use a restoration epoxy right. to help sculpt the missing bits or to help fill it, fill it out and stabilize it. So for example, this one, we'll go back to this one again. This one is a uh, vertebrae. vertebrae from Edmontosaurus. Right. And it was really badly crushed. Bondo kind of a deal. Mm -hmm. Yep, this is kind of giving it some strength and stability. This right. is a, a paleo bond epoxy uh, resin. It's like surfboard repair. Yep, it's called paleo sculpt. Yeah. And uh, we put the pieces back together as best we can. And uh -huh. what we can't put back together, we use that to sculpt the missing bits. Wow. This had uh, what we call iron pyrite disease, which is a. Yeah, you mentioned that before. Yeah. What it's, is that? Iron pyrite disease sounds pretty bad. It is pretty bad for the bones. But um, basically this is where you get a lot of sulfides in the groundwater and the sulfur is mixing with the groundwater and you get the sulfuric acids, you get uh, uh, gypsum forming, uh, this is a calcium sulfate, and those crystals begin to grow and expand. And, and, rip it and blow it apart. So this right. is not a disease that the animal had in its lifetime. No. This is a disease for its after its fossilization. Yeah, it's a geochemical disease. Right. A geochemical. How long do you think it takes for these creatures to be go from bone to rock, meaning fossil, for their material to be replaced? Sure, that's a good question too. Um, you know, and various there's various studies that, that talk about how fossils form and, and, and the process. Um, basically, the minerals are being replaced with other minerals. So the original calcium phosphate that was in the bone, the apatite, right? Uh, that's our natural organic yeah. phosphate that is getting slowly replaced in this particular case with iron oxide. Huh. Okay. Uh, and as far as some some fossils can be preserved fairly quickly. Others like this take millions of years. Millions. So buffalo, for example, that were slaughtered aren't probably old enough to be fossilized yet. They're still fossils because they're evidence of ancient life. Oh, okay. And there is some mineralization sometimes. Like if it's 400 years old, probably not much mineralization. You're, right. Most of these, even some stuff that's 10, 20,000 years, you're still getting DNA out of it. Right. Um, like Pleistocene era guys. Right. Right. But there is... Um, we don't you, talk about mammals here. <laughs> We're not doing the mammals. Don't do any mammals. No I'm more mammals. Sorry. No more mammals. It's my bad, man. Stinky, sweaty, smelly, hairy, Furry. Yeah, I know. Miserable creatures. Yeah, I hate them too. <laughs> <laughs> so you got all this stuff and it's waiting. And some of this will make it to the marketplace, hopefully. Yeah. Well, we split them up into three categories. Common, commercial grade, and science grade. Common things we let our tour guests keep. Uh -huh. You know, because they're fragments of bone, they're all over the place. Right. And I would much rather see those in the hands of a kid. An inspired young person. To inspire them, to educate right. them, to spread that joy of natural history. Um, you know, so those little fragments, those little common species, not a big deal. They can go, right. go private. Uh, then there's commercial bits, which have a little bit more value to them. Maybe aesthetic and aesthetic. whatever. Aesthetic. Here's, here's one, for example, that's a commercial one. This is a Tyrannosaur tooth. Wow. Tyrannosaurs, all, in fact, all dinosaurs were kind of like sharks. They were constantly replacing their teeth over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So a T-Rex could have maybe a thousand teeth in a lifetime. Right. right. But as far as their claws are concerned, how many claws did they have in their hands? Three. Four. Oh, four. Two on each hand. So they only had four. Oh, four. Oh, two, oh, four. oh okay. In their hands. Yeah. They four had to hands. protect those. Yeah. So finding a claw is very rare. That jumps it up more to the science side of things. Got it. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, when it comes to T-Rex teeth, they're, they're quite beautiful. They are prized by collectors. Uh -huh. 
And when we sell something like this, the landowner gets a percentage of it. Right. So it's a positive incentive for him to to allow us out there. Right. If there was no reason for for from benefit, why why would he let us out on his ranch? Right. Ranch. Right. It's like mineral rights. Yeah. So the landowner gets a little something. Uh, we get you know, we could pay for our expenses, right. for example. Of so Carol, so that'll get on the website soon. Yeah, that one probably will. Yeah. Now others that are more pathologic teeth, there's something weird about them, those will hold them for science. But yeah, I'll show you a commercial one. Okay. Uh, uh, when I find something like this, I call it nature providing me a grant. Good. That's, and there's a market there. People want this stuff. Absolutely. That's yeah. a, a $10,000 piece. Oh my God. I sell one of those, I've paid for my, uh, my whole summer's worth of digging, essentially. Really? So, yeah. Yeah. So the landowner gets something, uh, a collector gets something nice to show off. And you get it. It's a win-win-win. I can't wait for tomorrow because that's going to be my first day in the field. Yep. And this has been so much fun. And I, I just want to thank anybody who's watching. And um, we're just at the tail end of this season, but there's a spring and there's a summer. I guess when can you start getting out there again and feeling like... It, well, usually June, July, and August, that's when we do our tours. I'll start taking reservations in December, and then usually by January or February, we're, we're book solid. Oh, really? Okay. So we but, fill up pretty quick. But in terms of digging, like when do you feel like you can start? In the spring? Oh, as, far as, the tour, uh, as far as digging is concerned, um, I will sometimes be able to start April, May, depending on the weather. In the winter, yeah. But South Dakota weather is just, it, you just throw a dart at a board, it, it could be anything on any given moment. Right, and that's when nature gets to paint perhaps a fresh canvas for you true true yeah we, yeah yeah we like that erosion we like the heavy rain because it exposes more stuff but also we have to be out there fast to catch them before they before they're gone by the way yeah. yeah wow well thanks man for this conversation it's so much fun dude i really appreciate well, it well we're gonna get you out there tomorrow tomorrow we'll, while you do digging yeah so folks thanks right. for hanging with me uh, till next time, namaste, shalom, and aloha, by that I mean, Al namaste, shaloha. I'm with Walter Stein, the paleontologist. He is the creator, founder, and manager of Paleo Adventures, and I have had an adventure just within the comfortable confines of his own personal museum. So <laughs> thanks, bro. I appreciate it. All right.